Hello everyone, this is Bob Souza speaking from historic Main Street in Somerset Village. TV9 is proud to present to you today the Boston Red Sox greatest player and perhaps the greatest hitter who ever lived in all of baseball, period. Theodore Samuel Williams, Ted Williams, better known as the kid, emerged through the Boston Red Sox organization in 1936, he was at Hoover High School in San Diego, California, where our video begins today. We'll have Tom Seaver, later a broadcasting legend himself on NBC and broadcasting for the New York Mets and for the New York Yankees. Tom takes us back to 1978 when he and Ted Williams gather to discuss the career of the great one from San Diego. For Ted, a lifetime of friendship with three other uh, Pacific Coast players. Bobby Dorr, silent captain of the Red Sox, played with the Hollywood Stars, Pacific Coast League. Dominic DiMaggio, the great center fielder, brother of Joe, played for the San Francisco Seals and missions in the Coast League. Johnny Pesky played for the Portland Beavers. Before that, John was clubhouse boy for Portland and had the distinct honor of shining Bobby Doerr's shoes when Doerr came to Portland to play against Johnny's team. Bob was a, Bobby was only 17. Bobby is the oldest living member of the Cooperstown Hall of Fame, and of course the only living member of the famous foursome from the West Coast that played many years in Boston. Tom Seaver's interview with Ted touches on some great years. 1941 would be one of the most outstanding. Ted won the All-Star Game at Briggs Stadium in Detroit with a dramatic three-run homer in the last inning. That'll be featured in today's film. Also, tremendous video of Ted batting 406 on the final day of the season. The Red Sox were playing in Philadelphia at Shy Park in a doubleheader against Connie Mack's last place athletics. Ted went into the game batting 399.5 which rounded off would be 400. Joe Cronin, the player manager of the Red Sox, asked if Ted would want to sit out the game. He said, no way. He says, I've come to play. You must hit 400 on the field and not on the bench. He went six for eight in the doubleheader, finishing at 406 for the year. Also in 1941, he hit 14 fly balls to the outfield, which scored runners from third base. Today's scoring system would have no time at bat so that he would have 14 more points. But then in 1941, it was a charge time at bat without a hit, no sacrifice fly. So Cronin pointed out he could have batted uh, at least 420 in that season. And that was also the season of Joe DiMaggio's 56 game hitting streak. So 1941, a great year for Ted Williams and especially for Major League Baseball. In 42, Ted played and won the Triple Crown. He did not receive the Most Valuable Player Award voting that went to Joe Gordon of the New York Yankees, even though Ted dominated in all three areas. Now, 1942-43, I'm sorry, 43-44-45, his country called. He went into service as a bomber pilot in World War II. Following the war, in 46, he had another great year leading his Red Sox to the World Series, tragic loss, seven games to the St. Louis Cardinals. 
but the series might have been lost before it even started. The Cardinals tied the Brooklyn Dodgers for first place in the National League, resulting in a three-game playoff, first one in history. The Dodgers went to St. Louis and lost, then back in Brooklyn, they lost. But to kill time, to keep the players sharp, the Red Sox scheduled an exhibition game against major league players from Washington, Philadelphia, New York, Cleveland, and Chicago. Game to be played at Fenway Park. Game one, 40 degree temperature, mist, cold wind, and left-handed knuckleballer Mickey Hefner pitching. He hit Williams on the elbow, and that ended the series. Well, a two-game series ended halfway through game one, with Ted being iced constantly to get the swelling down. He had a very poor World Series, five meaningless hits, all singles, and it resulted in his being off and the Red Sox losing in seven games to the Cardinals. The other thing 1946 would be noted for would be great performance in the All-Star game, hitting the long home run off Rip Sewell's blooper ball, which said could not be done. In that particular World Series, I'm sorry, in that particular All-Star game, Ted did hit two home runs. The American League won 12 to nothing in Fenway Park. One thing I've always wanted to do, pitch against the best hitter of all time, Ted Williams. All right, three and two, bases loaded. Two men out, winning run at third, right? Oh, the winning run at third, huh? Bases loaded. Gotcha, all right. Three and two, all right. you gotta concentrate. Ball four. <laughs> Where are we going? Come on, come on. I'm going to take you down where it all started. You drive. I'll tell you where to go. You going to trust me? I don't know. You're a pitcher. Remember that. <laughs> pitcher. Bucket of bolts. Ever been chauffeured around by a pitcher before? What do you think of that, start, man? <laughs> <laughs> Ted, I know where you're taking me. You're taking me back to your old high school. I had heard stories about how Williams would go and hit and hit and hit. Listen, you got to work hard to succeed and uh, be dedicated. And a lot of people that saw me as a young kid said, yeah, I think he can be a pretty good hitter. But I don't think there's anybody that ever said, yeah, he's going to be a great hitter. Yeah. I think you got to build into that. Well, you certainly did some building here, didn't you? Tom, this is where it all started. This is it, huh? Hoover High School? Yeah, I have an awful lot of memories here. Uh, it's newer now but the locations are the same and i look out towards left field yeah and i remember that uh in my last year i there was a scout with the cardinals who used to watch me every day he had the glasses on me you know <laughs> and uh he was the first scout that ever come to my house and said i'd like to get you for the st louis cardinals did you play left field at here i was a pitcher here you didn't picture. know that? You didn't know that? Well, I want to tell you, Were you buddy, any good? If we'll get to the next Well, question. I want to tell you, there was a Coast League team here, San Diego Padres, and I was signed as a pitcher outfielder. Pitcher outfielder. Pitcher first and then outfielder? Well, uh, I'm not sure of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I did pitch in the Coast League, and uh, I got knocked around a little bit, and uh, they forgot about my pitching. One of the great things of any young ball player, be it a Ted Williams or even one of these kids here at Hoover High, is that first time you get called to the big leagues. Do you remember that? That is an easy one. I was getting attention from right. some of the scouts. And I remember, and I was disappointed that I had been sold to the Red Sox. But I was, wasn't destined to be uh, uh, a member of the team that year because they had a great outfield. And then you got called the next year, 39. Was that your first year in the big leagues? 39 was my first year in the big leagues. 
Ted, you once said that you could remember every instance about your first 300 home runs. I'm going to give you an easy one, the 1941 All-Star Game. Yeah, that's an easy one because it was the biggest thrill I ever got in baseball. And yeah, you've said that it happened. Before, right? It happened just at the right time yeah. in a young player's career. Where, and it was my first start in an All-Star Game. And Claude Passo had had a great year. Ninth inning, more than 54,000 in Detroit's Briggs Stadium wait in anticipation. Claude Passo delivers ball four. You watch Cecil Travis. That loads the bases with one out. Waiting to bat, Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams. DiMaggio, the hitter, Passo's pitch. Ground ball is short, might be two. Miller to Herman for one relay, not in time. America League is still alive, and that sets the stage for Ted Williams. Two on, two out. American League trailing by one run. Williams takes a strike from Claude Passeau. And the next pitch, long drive, deep right field. Maybe the ball game, home run. Ted Williams has just won the All-Star game with a ninth inning dramatic three-run home run. The American League wins seven to five. And Ted Williams having a tremendous year, hitting over 400. Is there anybody who can get him out? I have to think that I had the league betwixt and between. They didn't know whether to pitch me high. They didn't know whether to pitch me low. They didn't know what to do. Yeah. And the league was made to order for me then. I knew the pitchers. I was stronger. I had more confidence. And again, I had everybody in doubt. Well, how do you pitch this guy? Nobody would hit 400 for 11 years. And now I'm realizing the importance of the possibility of hitting 400. I really wanted to hit 400. And uh, the thought of ever not playing that, the last game after getting a hit, or even if I hadn't have played the last game, it would have been officially 400. But it never entered my mind, never once, of not playing. Tell me about the last game. And this is something that, that uh, was really uh, unusual. I got up to the plate, and I'm all set to hit. The pitcher was taking the sign, and all of a sudden, Bill McGowan, the umpire, stopped the game momentarily, and he, he turned his back towards the pitcher, and he started wiping the plate again. Right. It was perfectly clean, but he started wiping the plate again. <laughs> and he said, bending down, he said, in order to hit 400, he says, you got to be loose. Now, he did that for my benefit, see? Sure. And then Frankie Hayes, who was the catcher, said, we're going to pitch to you. He said, we're not going to give you anything, but he said, we're going to pitch to you. Mr. Max said to pitch to you. Remember this day, fans, September 28, 1941. It may be a history-making day. Red Sox and A's in a doubleheader here at Chive Park in Philadelphia. But all eyes are on this man, Ted Williams, gunning for a 400 season. He's hitting an even 400. I think if I were Ted, I would sit out today, but Ted never backed into anything. Dick Fowler, the pitcher for the Philadelphia A's. Here's the pitch to Williams. Line drive, base hit. Ted Williams has a hit in his first at bat. Ted now three for four. First game of the double bill. The pitch to him, long drive, deep right field. This ball is out of here. Ted Williams, four for five in game one, is still going to play the second one. Second game of the doubleheader. Williams, a line drive, blue darter. It hits the horn in right field, and Ted has himself a double. Ted finishes the doubleheader six for eight, batting 406. Not too bad a day. Not, Not a bad, bad day. day. All of them blue darters? No, I think most of them were. I know I hit two or three between first and second. I hit that horn. I don't remember any cheap hits. Did you ever get a cheap hit? I don't like to remember them, but I sure got them. I remember, I remember I got one one time, it was 2,400 hit or somebody, and there was a real squeaker over shortstop, right on the fist, you know? And the pitcher hollered out to me, he says, you ought to be proud of that one, he said. <laughs> Ted, you had a great rookie year, an outstanding sophomore year. In your third year, you hit over 400. You know, how can you follow up? I always forget about the year that just passed. Always feeling that you've got to do better the next year. Right. That's the way I always uh, kind of program myself. Personally, for you, 42 was a great year. That's right. You lead the league in hitting. You lead the league in home runs. You lead the league in RBIs. After 1942, the Triple Crown year, you lose what really are three of your prime years to World War II. Uh, I can think of four or five uh, players that, yeah. uh, whose careers uh, were great that uh, were penalized during those years, but uh, I've never regretted those. You come back out of the service, 1946. Lou Boudreau did something that might have altered your career. By the middle of 46, 
Ira's really uh, uh, tattooing the ball right. and then and, and breaking up a lot of things. In fact, so much so that Lou Boudreau uh, devised the uh, the William Shift. Boudreau Shift is what they called it. I call it the William <laughs> Shift. <laughs> the shortstop was playing right behind second base, right. and the third baseman was in just a little bit to protect against the bunt. So I could see that I was uh, losing hits. That's when I started to really realize I've got to really do something about this. The next batter is Ted Williams, trying to solve the puzzle of that Boudreau ship. Boy, that left side looks tempting, but Ted likes to pull. Williams is butting. It's a beauty base hit for Ted Williams. Oh, that'll sure shake him up. And as a result, they started to loosen up a little bit, but really and truly, they never broke up that shift, even until uh, the last part of my career. The 1946 All-Star Game, after coming back from the war, was another, you know, I mean, you've got memorable events all the way through your career, but this is another one. Well, yeah, I had to be charged up for that one because uh, it was in Boston, uh, oh. the only All-Star Game I played in Boston. Well, it's the eighth inning here at Fenway Park, and this jam-packed house has seen Ted Williams day to day. Already, Williams has two singles and a home run. Now he's facing Rip Sewell on the mound with that famed blooper pitch. I don't think even Williams could hit that ball out. We talked about it before the game, and we all agreed pretty much that it couldn't be done. Here it comes. There she goes! And the thing of it is that uh, I had to supply all the power myself, you know, it was just like a little girl could hit that ball, but how far they could hit it would be another matter. After the War of 46, what kind of team did the Red Sox have? Well, they had acquired some fellows during the war that really added strength uh, to the Red Sox team. It's 1946, a banner year for the Boston Red Sox. Sox owner Tom Yawkey and general manager Eddie Collins welcome home their troops from the war. Big Tex Hewson dusts off the old fastball. Bobby Doerr and Johnny Pesky are back in double play depth. Tom DiMaggio patrols the outfield. But the big news in Beantown is the return of Ted Williams. After a three-year hiatus, Triple Crown Ted shows he's still got that sweet, smooth swing. And spearheads the Sox to their first pennant in 28 years. So the 46 World Series features Ted Williams and Stan Musial, the game's two most valuable players. It's a dramatic series. The St. Louis Cardinals finally nailing it down in the seventh game. But for Williams, the series is nothing but frustration. Even when he hits it well, there always seems to be someone there to nab it. He can only manage five hits and one RBI in seven games. A bitter disappointment for both the Red Sox and their number one slugger, Ted Williams. Biggest disappointment of my, my career really ha was uh, my poor showing in the series. I didn't do very well, and uh, I always hoped that I certainly would get in another, and I never did. Yeah. Even though you lost the 46 World Series, you did win the Most Valuable Player Award. Oh, you bet. It was the first time I'd won it, and it certainly was a big thrill. Next year, you're a Triple Crown winner, and you don't win the Most Valuable Player Award. I can't believe it. Well, I always felt that, to some degree, that wasn't fair. But I have to say this, that uh, uh, I only lost out by one point, and I lost out to the greatest player I ever saw, Joe DiMaggio. Was there some discrepancy in the voting that you feel, Ted? Well, there was a Boston writer uh, who I had had an argument with that summer, and um, he failed to give me a 10th place vote, not even a 10th place vote. He didn't put vote. you in the top 10, That's right? right, and a 10th place vote would have given me two two points. You were the triple crown winner and he yeah, didn't put you in the yeah, top ten. That's right. I don't think he liked you. <laughs> I don't think so. During this period of the right after the war, 1946 to 1950, you had a kind of a stormy relationship with the press and the fans in Boston. Yeah, that's right. And I provoked uh, a little ill feeling uh, on a couple occasions when I made some nasty gestures and the press had uh, made it an extra special point to try to really lay it on me. Right. Right. In fact, they even went so far, some of them, to say, is that I ought to quit. And uh, it just so happened that they had their first family night in Boston. There was a lot of press there, and they were all going to see just how the fans were going to react and how uh, old Ted was going to get crucified right there at home plate. 
And I want to tell you, they in mass rose and they give me one of the greatest ovations I ever had. And I changed my feeling about Boston fandom. I realized then that baseball fans of New England were really for Ted Williams and that uh, I, I felt that way all the rest of my days. I think it's about time you taught me a little something about hitting, what do you say? All right, that might not be too easy. <laughs> <laughs> This is a bat. Very good, I got that. And I want to see how well you use it. You're talking to one of the best hitting pitchers of the round. Now, we'll know that. see, we'll see. You sound like you don't believe that. Don't All get right. hurt. <laughs> don't get hurt and then get a strike. Pretty good punch. All right, coach. That might get him over. All right, watch the swing now. All right. Oh, oh, oh. Heart was in it, but you know, the rest of the body. <laughs> Looked like it was bailing a little bit. If you're going to take a young hitter and give him one piece of advice, well, the basic things about hitting, what would you say? Well, he's got to get a good ball to hit. And that means that a ball that hasn't fooled him or that is not in a tough place in his strike zone. And I think that there would be the number one physical thing that I would talk about in starting a baseball swing. Anybody ever teach you how to hit? Nobody Starting had, right here at Hoover High and all the way up to No, you. but I, I tell you what, I did have natural ability, but I, I, uh, I practice as much as anybody I've ever known. I have to think, and I said it, that to hit a baseball is the hardest single thing to do in sports. 1949, your second most valuable player award, and then even after that, another kind of disappointment in your career. You had to go to war again, Korea. I was called back with a bunch of reserves. Back in the airplanes? That's right. How long did you uh, spend over there, Ted, in Korea? Well, I was over there in 51, and 50, part of 52, and I missed the 51, 52 season pretty much. So you come back from the war, and you have some pretty good years, and you get to 1957, you're 38 years old, and you have what people have called your golden year. Well, you know, a funny thing happened there that spring. I had used a heavier bat in spring training. And I was hitting the ball, just meeting the ball, you know, and, and the ball was just ringing off my bat. Ted Williams, at age 38, hitting like the splendid splitter of old. Using a heavier bat to complement his added girth, Williams is simply shattering the baseball. On May 8th, he hits three home runs in a single game. Then a month later, duplicates this feat to tie a major league record. The Yankees' Mickey Mantle makes a run at Williams for the batting title. But in late September, Williams hits a towering round tripper to start an astonishing streak. And he leaves Mantle in the dust. Hitting home runs in four consecutive at-bats, reaching base safely an incredible 16 straight times, Teddy Ballgame finishes at a phenomenal 388 to become the oldest batting champion ever. And I was only six hits away that year of hitting 400 again. And, and, and that's one of the reasons I've always felt that there there's every chance in the world to, for another 400 hitter. You won the batting title in 1957, 38 years old. Player of the decade in 1960, you've got to start thinking about retirement. Well, as a matter of fact, after my poor 59 season, when I had a pinched nerve in my neck, I considered a retiring. In fact, Mr. Yawkey, the last time I saw him that season, he said, Ted, he said, I think you ought to retire. You're 41 years old. Then, that's right. right. Yeah. But I said to myself, if I feel good, I'm going to give it a try. Yeah. And that's what I did in 40, uh, in 1960. Tell me about your last time at bat. I got to hear about that. <clears throat> well, it had to be a great thrill for me. You're in Fenway Park, In right? Fenway Park. Against to Baltimore. A lousy day. Yeah. And uh, Jack Fisher was a pitcher. I knew it was the last time I was going to get up. And uh, that uh, this was it for me. I'd already made up my mind that I was going to quit. Well, fans, this is it. Ted Williams going to the bat rack for the final time. These Boston fans adore number nine. Everybody standing at Fenway Park. Imagine the thoughts going through his mind. Ted would like to go out with a bang. Williams takes ball one. Swing and a miss. No doubt Williams is going for the fences. Long drive to deep right field. Williams may have got it. He has a home run. Ted Williams is hit number 521 in his final at back in the major league. Who else could do it for Ted? Ted 
Williams crosses home plate for the last time. Ted, you retired in 1960. What were, you, what were your interests after that? Well, immediately I, uh, I got connected with uh, Sears Roebuck. Right. And at present, I am chairman of their sports advisory committee. Fishing is your hobby, isn't it? It certainly is. I live in Florida uh, in a great fishing area, and I spend my summers up in the Brunswick fishing for Atlantic salmon, the greatest of all fish. You took a little time off from your fishing trips and went up to Cooperstown for the Hall of Fame, didn't you? Well, that has to be the, one of the greatest thrills that can ever happen to a ball player. I received 280-odd votes from the riders, and I know I didn't have 280-odd close friends among the riders. <laughs> but I know that it's the greatest thrill of my life. Ted Williams, lifetime batting average, 344. American League batting champ, six times. 521 home runs. Major League Player of the Year, four times. American League All-Star, 18 times. Player of the Decade, 1951 through 1960. The last man to hit 400, Ted Williams, the greatest hitter of them all. great legacy of Ted Williams continues because changes were made in the batting title significance because no longer would at-bats be determined as the only way a, pay, a player could qualify to win the title. Originally it was 500 at-bats, but of course Ted Williams would get up 500 times but he would be walked 100 to 120 times, and that would subtract from his at-bat total. So Major League Baseball changed it to plate appearances. So now Ted Williams could get up 500 plus times and receive 100 to 120 walks, and it would still qualify for the batting title because he was at-bat as a plate appearance, and that was more significant than just being, you know, receiving a walk and being credited with an at-bat. So plate appearances superseded at-bats because of Ted. This cost him two other batting titles, 1954, the Bobby Avila of Cleveland, and 1960, the fellow teammate Pete Runnels of the Red Sox. We shall conclude today's video with another All-Star appearance. The 70th All-Star Game honors the All-Century Team, Fenway Park, 1999. Ted Williams, a prominent member of the All-Century Team, made the appearance to Fenway even though he had suffered many strokes in recent times and only had partial vision. All the players gathered around him at home plate, wishing him the very best. For many, it would be the last time they would ever see him alive. Thank you very much, folks, for watching. You've been a wonderful audience. Ladies and gentlemen, he wore the Red Sox uniform for 22 years. He wore the uniform of the United States Marines for four and a half more. He owned the left field at this very ballpark. He was the last man to hit 400 in a season, and he did it 58 years ago. He hit 521 home runs, including one on his last at bat. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the greatest hitter that ever lived. Number nine, Hall of Famer, baseball legend, Ted Williams!
Mattingly that. Ladies and gentlemen, and all the players on the field, it's requested, please, that the all century players the legends of this game, today's stars crowding around one of the greatest to ever play the game of baseball and one of the greatest to ever serve his country. We try as hard as we can and hope that this moment translates on television the feelings that we're getting here at Fenway Park at this 70th Midsummer Classic. Just a moment, Ted Williams. <laughs> My man, right here. You're going to be everybody. We'll throw out tonight's there. ceremonial first I'm pitch. Sorry I missed your party, Joe, but Bob, I do you find yourself party. asking, can't this go on forever to nobody in particular? I personally hope it does because I don't know if I can speak. <laughs> what a moment. Watch somebody like Mike Piazza, who Ted Williams. Oh, all right. Told at a very young age when he was 16, when he was introduced to him, that you will be a major leaguer after seeing his swing. Ted Williams was right, and here tonight, Mike Piazza on hand to help celebrate one of the game's greatest players of all time. He is a star among stars, and on a night like this, that's saying a lot. Whacking Mark McGuire on the left shoulder. Ted Williams will throw out tonight's ceremonial first pitch. He will throw it to Carlton Fisk. I know I saw Yastrzemski on hand as well. A celebration here tonight in Boston. With help from Tony Gwynn. Where is he? He went in. Oh, all right. Congratulations to Ted Williams. Congratulations to the game of baseball. Here tonight, a wonderful July night in Boston. The splendid splinter was a dead pull hitter with a lumber heaver wheel. The kid was genius, he was an artist. And his canvas was a field of green grass beneath New England sunshine. And with strokes so pure and clean, he painted line drives down the chalk line. The likes of which the game had never seen. Teddy ball game had but one aim to be the greatest of all time. But when his country called upon him, he put that bat down in his prime. And sometimes I imagine that I am the great old number nine, and I am. Digging in at Fenway to smash one last line drive, my last at bat. Teddy went like that. Yeah, my many go like that. Then he tipped his cap to no one. Williams hit it into the Red Sox bullpen, scattering his teammates. Then he circled the bases for the last time. His long career of feuding with the fans and the press was over. Some hoped he might finally tip his cap, something he had not done since his rookie year. Still some sports writers, they just couldn't quite understand. Who needs 
fair ink when you can paint a canvas like that. Great last at that. Teddy went like that. Yeah, how many go like that? Then he tipped his cap to no one. Well, I'm headed up to Boston. Fenway Park is where I'm bound. Because wherever Teddy Ballgame swung his bat is hallowed. 